how quiet and still it's been. That's what we're dealing with in the lesson this morning. Is God's will is to be still. God's will is to be still. Now in Job 37, let's stand and read verse 14. This is one of Job's supposed friends, a young man. But he is giving him a good piece of advice that everybody needs to take seriously. <clears throat> 37 verse number 14 I marked some years ago. And this uh, young fellow Elihu speaks a truth. You know, we speak truth sometimes, but it's not at the right time. Truth, truth is uh, something that needs to be spoken at the right time so that it does its work. <clears throat> Here he says to Job, hearken unto this, O Job. And what else? What does he say? Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Isn't that a good verse? Let's read it, read it together. Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still, and consider the wondrous works of God. So Lord, we ask you again to meet with us in this particular time of the service around the true, perfect word of God. <clears throat> Help us to consider the wonderful, marvelous works of God as we watch you work in our lives and through our lives uh, for the sake of souls, uh, for all eternity. People are going to live forever once they're born. And may they receive Christ as their Savior so they can go to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. So, he says, stand still and consider the marvelous works of God. I'm glad we have four seasons here in uh, Missouri. Why? Well, you get to see all the marvelous works of God. Some people, that, let's say, uh, the frigid North Pole, they can't see what we see. Uh, missionaries coming from North Dakota uh, in a couple of weeks, they'll come down Missouri. And usually you leave North Dakota and it's brown and gray and fields are all harvested and they come down and you get to the Ozarks and then it starts greening up. How many notice that when you come back from the north? Amen. Especially the wintertime. To them, this is a great place, you know, because they look, they have a short short summer, and so they come and get to see more glorious works of God down here. And it's good to see the kids here today. You know what they're learning to do? You know what they're learning to do by threat of their life? They're learning to sit still in church. <laughs> well, that's great. You'll see the power of being still before God. Yeah. yeah, most churches have children's programs. I was a children's church director for many, uh, 12 or 13 years. And, uh, some classes I had 300 in junior churches and gymnasiums. And had uh, I was a bus director. Had one time I had 17 bus routes every Sunday morning to oversee. And and uh, then I had 12. I had 630 kids come, uh, not kids, riders. Uh, for our Easter service, 630 rider buses on 12 buses, and we were packed out like sardines, you know, back before the laws got so strict on busing. So uh, we live in the land of bigness and busyness. Agreed? Yeah. Bigness and busyness is where we live. The, the land of trying and uh, the land of not trusting. Trying versus trusting, and, and religions do that. Try, 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 try harder, try, 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 and guess what? Die and go to hell trying. But uh, we are people of trust. We trust God, and the Bible tells us to trust others as well. And so we live in this big and busy trying time, and uh, we're, we're living in the land of a super, super stirred society. The media, that's all they do. They just stir it up, stir it up. That's why it doesn't take long for people to get into an argument because they have different viewpoints and they can't agree on anything. Tomorrow, all the news changes anyway to re-stir the pot. So we're going uh, 
in our society, we're going from morphine to methamphetamines. Uh, the downers, the opioid epidemics, and the, uh, you might say the, uh, the downers of heroin and uh, morphine, all the way to the crazy people that stay up four days in a row on methamphetamine and rob, kill, and steal. And, I mean, you got those two extremes, and it's, it's, it, the whole, everything is gone crazy. Yeah. Just like Jesus said, perilous times mm -hmm. will come. Amen. Fearful times will come, he said. So now get this, Christ is and Christ was the most powerful person on the planet. Agree? Amen. Is and was and never once taught us to scurry and hurry to make things happen. Right. You'll never find Jesus saying, come on fellas, let's hurry up. They're waiting for me. Let's hurry up. It's not in there. It's called the Christian walk, not the Christian run. It's not called the Christian crawl either. Yeah. So he never once taught us to scurry and hurry to make things happen, even in the name of God. Christians are supposed to be controlled people led by the Holy Spirit in confidence and in quietness. Yeah, and we'll see that in the life of Christ in just a few minutes. So we want to see... The power of stillness. Go to 1 Kings, if you would. Hang a left from Job. And over in 1 Kings, it's, we've seen that <clears throat> Elijah has just been through this spiritual battle with the prophets of Baal. And he's outrun Ahab's chariot. I figure almost 25 miles, like a marathon. And the guy is just plumb wore out. His life was threatened by Jezebel, and he runs and hides under a tree. He was this powerful man, but because of all the busyness and the energy it took to do what he did, now he's, uh, his battery is on low, really low. Now in uh, 1 Kings 19, first thing we see about stillness, all right? That's what the young man said, be still. And uh, consider. So stillness, what is the power of this? Stillness allows us to really hear God's voice. When we read our Bibles, we should be, have our heart's ear open to God speaking to us through his word. Now if you don't read the Bible, or just would you just maybe take a Bible and sit there and open it? At least let God know you're there for him. And then start reading. What you understand, this ask God to help you do it. What you don't understand, you'll come back later and as you grow as a Christian, you will understand it. Yeah. But, but to, to, to not ever open the Bible and never pray and never take the time to sit still before God, uh, your life will be powerless. Let me right. just say, if you're saved, now if you're lost, you're just lost. Right. You can read all the Bible you want until you get saved. The Bible makes no sense, and that's why people say, I don't understand it. And they have all the new translations, and they still say, I don't understand it. You know, make a new comic book, I still don't understand it. Because the truths of God are spiritual truths. And until you're saved, you really can't receive it into your heart as a sinner and dead in trespasses and in sins. So stillness, first of all, allows us to really hear God's word. So here we find Elijah wore out, and God sends him an angel while he's uh, sleeping, and he feeds him. He has to start from scratch. Now they say uh, batteries, the older batteries that we have used uh, in our cell phones, that it's better to let a battery work its way all the way down so it can receive a fresh new charge and, and the battery will last longer if you do that. Now the new type of batteries don't work the way the old acid types work. But, but so we see the guy completely depleted of strength and then God feeds him. Look at verse eight, Elijah in 19.8. Uh, and he rose and did eat and drank and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb the Mount of God. 
All right, and he came thither <clears throat> unto a cave and lodged there. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. So he's in a cave, he's in a secure place, and he's got his strength back from his food and his sleep. And he said unto him, the Lord said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. <clears throat> they seek my life to take it away. And God didn't say, poor, poor old Elijah. He didn't say, poor boy. He just said, look, we got to go. And he said, what? I, you got an excuse, but we got work to do. Go forth and stand in, <clears throat> on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great. So we see all this uh, noise and energy. Now I'd say most of the big churches right now have the bands going and the drums beating and the swinging and the swaying of the singers and, and all kinds of uh, platform dancing they do now in church services. And uh, I can see all that. Well, here's, here's what he's trying to show him. The bigness and the busyness versus the stillness. <clears throat> Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord pass by. And a great and strong wind rent or tore the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Just because it was a mighty moving didn't mean God was in there. And after the wind, what else? An earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. You see the waking and the shaking and God was not in there. And after the earthquake, a fire <clears throat> but the Lord was not in the fire. Now here we go. And after the fire, a what? Still, small voice. God is not, I used to go to conferences and I, I'll be in one in November, <clears throat> but I, I never went to get fired up, all right? I'd go to fellowship and get a few days rest, but a lot of conferences you go to, you're already wore out as a pastor, and they want to get you more wore out. You know, yeah. we got a new program, we have a new, everybody needs to do this, and that's what the denominations do. They keep everybody stirred up from the headquarters, which are unscriptural. And, uh, but the still small voice is what you want to be quiet enough to hear the Lord speaking. Yeah. And it was so when Elijah heard it <clears throat> that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out, stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here? And so we see here he, he could move on once he understood the voice of God. He had his power back. Now quickly turn to Isaiah 30. But you see the power of the stillness of the voice of God here. <clears throat> Still small voice. Now, in Isaiah 30, it covers some of this about uh, God gives us power through being still. As I've said before, the faster things get, the slower I'll be so I can make better decisions. <clears throat> now, look at 30. <clears throat> Israel has lost its power with God. Verse 1, 2, and 3. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. I'll ask everybody except God. And that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to their sin. That walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves so they're weak. Strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. So man trusting in man trying to get stronger doesn't work for a Christian we see here. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh <clears throat> be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. <clears throat> Christian will never better themselves by going to lost mankind. That's right. Man system, it's called worldliness. Right. Now, so he's He's telling us they're weak, they've lost their power, they just don't know it yet. Verse 7 and 8, 
For the Egyptians shall help in vain <clears throat> and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Now read this with me. Their strength is to sit still. While we're scurrying around looking for answers and help and better jobs and better this and better that, and bigger this and bigger that, God says, you don't know, Christian, that your strength is just to sit still and let God take over. That's <clears throat> what he says so clear here. And then verse 15 and uh, well, number eight. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come, how long? Forever and ever. God says, this is not going to change. The plan is not going to change. It's going to be, you sit still. How many parents have had to tell your kids to sit still and listen to me? Any, any parents ever done that? You've abused your children by making them sit still. Or how many are glad you've got some discipline at home? Even if it came on a rod or a well, other things that you're beat with, right? <laughs> 15 and 16, lastly here. <clears throat> For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. So you see, return to me and you rest before me and you shall be saved. And the Christian life is in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength and you would what? But you would not. Israel said, we're not doing it. Verse 16, lastly here. <clears throat> but you said, no, no, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee. And we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. You can run and run, you can run and run. God says, trouble will follow you and it will outrun you, it will catch you and it will destroy you. So we're told to hear the still small, still small voice. <clears throat> we're also told to sit still so God can strengthen us just like he did Elijah. Now go to Psalm 23. Secondly, so stillness allows us to really hear God's voice and receive his power. Now over in Psalm 23, we know this, but we usually only remember all of it together. If you break it down in pieces, <clears throat> there's all kinds of information there in the 23rd Psalm. <clears throat> Pardon me. 23, one and two. Read it with me, one and two. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the, what kind of waters? Why? Well, that's where you're refreshed, by the still waters, not by a roaring river or an ocean. <clears throat> now Mark chapter four, secondly here, so we, we're dealing now with not the power of God on our life, but the peace of God in our life. Amen. He maketh me. So let him make you, let him boss you around. He's called Lord anyway, you know. He's called Master. Why do we want to let him boss us around? Because we're dumb, that's why. If we do what the Master says, he blesses us. Right. If we do what the Lord says, he rewards us. Amen. If a child obeys their parents, guess what? They get treated pretty well. They get that bicycle. They get those roller skates. They get the candy bar. But if they're a little rebel, guess what? They get stood in the corner. Or time out, whatever that means. I'm glad my kids never had to go through that mind-bending process and just got a whooping and kept on ticking, right? <laughs> Mark 4, <clears throat> look at verse 37. <clears throat> Mark 4, verse number... 37. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And Jesus, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, 
Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now it's a prayer. <clears throat> they're talking to God, but they're questioning God. Make sure our prayers don't question God. Amen. They're not designed to question God. God's the only one who should be asking the questions, yeah. and he does. Carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, what? What did he say? Peace. Three words. Peace, Peace. be still. <clears throat> the wind ceased. There was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, if they can obey him, I guess we can too. I mean, if things that have no soul obey God, like the birds, the bees, the insects, and the microscopic bacteria, I guess if they all obey their creator, I guess we ought to as well. Especially us, because we're the only ones that have an eternal soul. Everything else is put here for us to oversee or to help to improve. God has given us plenty to do. We just need to learn to do it. <clears throat> so stillness first allows us to really hear God's voice and give us the power of God on our life. And secondly, stillness allows God to lead us down his paths of peace. So we have power, then we secondly we have peace through stillness, the power of stillness. Thirdly, out of four things, Look over in Exodus 14. Thirdly, stillness allows God to defend us. When we need help, we need protection, stillness is the answer. Not getting uh, psyched up for the, for the battle. And so they're, they've left Egypt and they're going through the wilderness and uh, they really need some help because Pharaoh said, I'm coming to get you. Now in Exodus 14, 12 <clears throat> says, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? So they're, they're griping because things are getting tough. So the Israelites have been captive 400 years and now they're turned loose as a nation. <clears throat> but when things get tough, they start bellyaching. Is not this the word that we did tell thee, Moses, in Egypt? saying, Let us alone, <clears throat> that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. <clears throat> Here we go. Hang on. Seat belts buckled. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, do what? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. So when things look uh, really difficult and we have enemies uh, that we don't want in situations that are totally beyond our control, so let God and the devil fight this one out, and God will win every time. We can't take it upon ourselves. Psalm 46, lastly here. Psalm 46. <clears throat> so he said, stand still, sit still. And here he tells us to just plain old be still. Be is a verb, I think, isn't it? Isn't it one of those little verbs that we study? So it is an action to be still. To be or not to be, that is the question. I heard that somewhere. Look at 46, verse 8 through 11. <clears throat> it says, Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He, meaning God, he maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. 
Read it with me, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. <clears throat> well, I tell you what. If America, if the leaders of America would just say, we need God. Yeah, amen. We don't need the stock market. We don't need the fish market. We need God. Amen. The God of the Bible. If they say that, people go nuts. They don't mind it being the God of Buddha, Shintoism, and uh, all the other isms, Islamism. And they don't. But the God of the Bible. Remember when, when we heard that many all through the last hundred years or so, how America was turned around and God's blessings were on. I don't remember, I mean, I know we've always had fires in California, but like this? Yeah. And we've had hurricanes, but like this? We've had earthquakes, but like this? And nobody says, we just need God! So things can go back to normal sin curse instead of elevated sin curse that we're living under. Amen. It is elevated punishment. Why? To show us that we're not right with God as human beings on this earth. So stillness allows God to defend us. <clears throat> he said you just need to stand still, sit still, and be still. <clears throat> not get in my way while I'm trying to help you. Then lastly, we see some things about Jesus himself here. Stillness allows God to meet our needs and provisions, so he brings us power through stillness. Uh, he brings us peace through stillness. He brings us protection through stillness and being his child and his servant. Matthew uh, chapter 12, look at that. Matthew 12, around verse number 17. It says if <clears throat> he's talking about a prophecy from Isaiah, <clears throat> that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, so Isaiah the prophet saying, which he goes back 500 years to Isaiah. And the quotation here in verse 18, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. He's meaning the Messiah. He's meaning the coming of Jesus Christ 500 years before he was born. He's giving us a character sketch of the Messiah. How will we know this guy? Will he be loud and proud? And will he uh, strike the enemy dead? No, not at all. My servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, <clears throat> whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He will show us our faults, and he will show us how to get out of that. It's called salvation. Uh, he shall not what? He's not coming to fight anybody. He shall not strive, nor cry. You won't hear a megaphone going off. Oh, he's over there. Hear all that noise? Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Jesus was not a street preacher. That's right. He was a street minister. He healed people. He taught people. He wasn't screaming at people, you're going to go to hell unless you come to me. <clears throat> he, he was a controlled, quiet, deliberate individual, forecast up to 700 years of the character of the Messiah. It says a bruised reed shall he not break. Even something, he's not come to, to tear anything down. Uh, and smoking flax shall he not quench. He's not coming to get involved in politics. He's not, he's not trying to uh, put out fires as it were. He's coming to show man his condition of darkness and, and come to the light of salvation for the Jews and the Gentiles. And so uh, 
And in his name, 4, uh, 21, shall the Gentiles trust. I like that verse. Because yeah. everybody in this room is in this verse here. Amen. And in, in his name shall the Gentiles try. No, trust. That's what salvation is. You just simply trust Christ for salvation. So we have, look at Luke 2.46 when he was just a kid. So he, we see the quietness here. We see the, uh, the attitude of Christ to come. He was not belligerent. He was not a, a loud-spoken politician uh, with an axe to grind. They tried to accuse him of that, but that's not who Jesus was. In Luke chapter 2, even as a kid, he knew how to sit still and think, correctly. 2.46 uh, we have here. Yeah. And it came to pass that after three days remember they lost Jesus because they went off on their own supposing uh, that he was with relatives. It came to pass after three days they found him in the temple doing what? Running around throwing songbooks. No. Sitting. In the, Jesus was a sitter, girls, guys. He went in and he sat down and he learned and he taught. <coughs> they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors or the teachers here, uh, both hearing them and asking them questions. So he listened, Jesus listened as a little boy and then he had questions he wanted to ask these supposedly wise men about God. And, uh, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Wow. Now John 12, 14, as you move to the right. John 12, 14. So we see the uh, personality of Jesus Christ here. He was a person who sat. He's a person who listened. He's a person who had an enormous amount of wisdom being God in the flesh anyway. And the 12, 14 uh, reads like this. And Jesus, when he had found uh, a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, the king cometh. What's he doing? He's sitting. Everywhere you find him doing something serious, he's sitting. He's teaching, he's sitting. He's, he's just not in a hurry. And uh, that's our fault, is we want God to act. One of our young preachers, we were training for years here, made the statement one day on the phone. He said, well, if God doesn't hurry up, I'm, I'm going to have to do something. Wow, I thought on the phone, I didn't say anything. I thought, what blasphemy this is. And he's going to be a preacher of the gospel, which he never was. Actually, he's got quite a few problems now. But if God doesn't hurry up, whoa, ho, ho. What page is that found on? There's no page in the Bible where God hurries up. He tells us to hurry up and catch up with what he's doing. But we don't say, God, hurry up, or, or what? You're going to fail in life? You're going to ruin your life if I don't respond to you as a genie in a bottle kind of a God? So that's what he's talking about. He's sitting on the on the ass's colt, it says here. And uh, 20 verse 12, run over there real quick and see what that says. We'll move to the end of the sermon. 2012, and the, the angels here, even the heaven works this way. And you see, if two angels in white, what were they doing? Sitting at the one end at the head, one at the other at the feet. Nobody's running around worried and what's happening, we don't know. And you, There's just, there's no frantic attitude in the heavens. Everything is calmly controlled. Lord. I mean, when you look down, that's why the Bible says man is a grasshopper. <laughs> man is like an ant. You know, you see a colony of ants, you won't see them sitting still. They're all over the place. So we see that we have to understand how God works. He works perfectly, okay? And he never gets in a hurry. And uh, 
it's, it's hard for most people to learn because we have so much uh, man's worldly news coming in popularity every ad advertisements are only I'm surprised the children are sitting here like this that's very good because commercials are only five seconds long now they can put five or six commercials in a 30 second spot you know make a fortune but they tell us what to do what to buy where to go how to act what to look like and that's always coming but heaven doesn't work that way mark 16 19 real quick Mark 16, 19, and uh, the end of the book of Mark. Where is Jesus right now? What's he doing right now? He's sitting on the throne of God. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, 16, 19, of Mark, he was received up into heaven, and did what? Sat on the right hand of God. Then they went forth and preached everywhere. So where is he today? He's still sitting on the throne of God. And he's uh, making intercession for the saints before God. So we need to talk to, to God through the Holy Spirit. And we need Jesus to transport that to the Father. And that he's, nobody's in a hurry over there. All right, so if we slow down, we can concentrate on what we really need, and we can talk to God about what we really need. And guess what? It will be acted on very quickly without being in a hurry. They'll just get her done, right? They'll just get her done. It's amazing the stuff that shows up that I pray for so quickly. I, I, it happens so often, I just can't keep track of it. Really, you don't have to just pray through you don't have to go go crazy to get God to help you. We'll show you this as we finish up here. I'm going to skip a couple of verses. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost because we're in the Pentecost headquarters town and uh, if you're not careful, people think you really got to do a lot of theatrics to get God to do something. That you have to moan and groan and you have to go through great fastings and all kinds of giving campaigns. But Acts chapter 2, it says here in verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so how long was Jesus on the earth after the resurrection? Forty days, right? And then he told them to go and wait well, 10 days later was the day of Pentecost. All right, that's where we pick up here. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So they weren't all doing their own thing. All right, like when churches break out in these uh, fits, I used to be raised in that kind of religion uh, in Virginia. Uh, they were all on the same page, as we say. Right? They were all had one goal. Let's say we were trying to raise money for a, a new building. We would want everybody to be on in one accord, in one place, and, and trying to build a new building. That's what you want is unity, right? Even on the job, your boss wants unity there so they can get something done. So that's what it, they did. Jesus told them to do this. And then suddenly there came a sound from heaven on the day of Pentecost, as of a rushing mighty wind. Now you have to understand, they did not pray this down. This didn't happen because they met and prayed through, like you're taught today. It was coming, it was planned, it was a special day, you just be there or you'll miss it. Suppose they didn't meet, you think it wouldn't have come? It was a planned event. Jesus said the promise of the Father in John 16, 14 and John 14, 16 tell us about the coming of the Holy Spirit after Jesus resurrected. Well, look here. It came as a sound from heaven, as a sound, all right, a sound from heaven, came a sound from heaven as, as, similar metaphor, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were 
standing, shouting, chanting. What were they really doing? It doesn't even say they were on their knees. It just says they were sitting. And God, the Spirit of God just shows up because that was the day God wanted the Holy Spirit to come to planet Earth. Not because they obeyed Christ. They, they would have missed out and wondered what happened. But why, because they obeyed Christ, they knew what was happening. They knew the scriptures of, of uh, what Jesus taught John. And so we have here, go back and see where it started in uh, uh, 1 verse 4. 1 verse 4 of Acts. <clears throat> Being assembled together with them, Jesus with them, they're on the Mount of Olives, commanded them that they should, commanded they should not depart from Jerusalem, but do what? I want you to wait for the promise. Of, he didn't say go pray for something great to happen. Just go and you wait. You sit, you sit still and you wait. Yeah. Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. And then the second reference before that happened, uh, 1, 13 and 14. And when they were come in, they left Olivet, went over to this uh, location. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and names the apostles here. And then we skip on down. Judas is dead. This Judas is the brother of James. And then verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, asking for supplies, right? That's what the word comes from. <coughs> supplication with the women. Hey, women, guess what? You're important in this. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So all the families came in together. They just sat and they waited and they prayed. And it went on for 10 days from the 40th day up to the 10th day, which is the day of Pentecost. So they're not begging, chanting, they're not ranting, they're not calling up incantations or spells or screaming or jumping or running or, or falling down and shaking or quaking or shouting, but they are there in quietness and control, waiting in the stillness. Amen. And God shows up. God showed up by the Holy Spirit as they heard. The, at this time, there were people from 16 different nations there for, for Pentecost, and they could hear clearly the gospel of Christ in their own language, it says in chapter 2. Not blah, 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 blah. I need an interpreter. Anybody know what he said? That's what they do today. It's gibberish. Here is languages so they could take the gospel back to their countries. Right. And that's what they did. The Ethiopian eunuch included that story. So we let's go home on this verse here, 1 Thessalonians 4. So the power of stillness, it brings us power in our life, it brings us peace in our life, it brings us protection in our life. And it brings provisions. The other verses were about the supplies uh, that came. It talks about Jesus sitting and Jesus. The other verses we skip with the blind man. Jesus, have mercy on us. And it says, Jesus stood still. Both those stories. And Jesus stood still. And the guy was healed when Jesus stood still. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9. Now, Let's see what we can extract here. 9 through 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. Page 1269. Sort of. 9 says, Paul says, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Agreed? Yes, sir. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, we beg you, we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, that ye study to be what? 
And that you study to be what? What's it say? Quiet. Study to be quiet. And to do your own business. And to work with your own hands. As we commanded you. So Christians are not loud and proud people. They're like an ant. They're busy as, as a beaver. They should be. And they don't get easily distracted into other people's lives. They're not busybodies. Because the Bible says we're not to be busybodies in other men's matters. Do your own business and to work with your own hands <coughs> as we commanded you. This is a good one, verse 12. That you may walk honestly toward them that are without the lost world. Walk honestly toward them that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. That's provision, isn't it? If we do God's bidding and study to be quiet and sit at the feet of Jesus with our Bibles and we ask God to provide for us and give us power and strength for the day and peace of heart and protection when we need it. But in these times, the election will be here in 20 some days and they say the fireworks will just begin on that day. So if you think it's pretty uh, crazy now in 20 some days, we need to learn to be quiet have you ever watched a dove and a blackbird in the backyard? I, I do. When a noise happens, the blackbird immediately goes, and it just scurry all over the place. Flocks of them. How many know that? Y'all, are y'all out there? Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, it takes nothing, and they just go. One spooks the other, spooks the other, spooks the other. But the same. Dove next to the blackbird doesn't fly. It sits there and it goes down and looks around. Then it may fly if it sees danger. Every time that there's a stir, they just go like that. Be uh, what does it say? Wise as a serpent and harmless as a as a dove. Yeah, the symbol of the Holy Spirit. So when society goes, everybody, everybody go crazy. You know that's what. That's what we got to do. And the Bible says, no, you don't. They might, but not my children. Yeah. My children are to learn to be controlled and quiet and still and be in direct contact with God Almighty. I'm glad that we're not have to be one with the universe. I'm glad we can be one with the creator of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to follow the crowd. And, and remember, following the crowd ruins your life. I remember that. I remember that. And I told one young man many years ago, I haven't always been a Sunday school teacher, son. I said, and I was saved out of the mud hole, the Bible says, the miry clay. And I said, I guess what? I have no intention of ever going back down there. No more intent. You can go because you ain't been there yet. I've been there, but I'm going up to glory land. Amen. I'm going to the mud hole. And all the liberals and people you know that are falling by the wayside and accepting anything that is popular in Christianity. And that their lives are not what they could be because they don't know the power of sitting still, standing still, and being still before God. So Father, we thank you for these great truths, these hidden gems of the Bible. We ask you now to help us be your servants and be your children and obey all that you tell us to do, but not to do your work. Let you do your work through us and for us. So we ask you now to even save a soul today. Pray for our neighborhood, around the church, and around our own houses. Help us to be that unusual Christian that they, they find. A Christian that is somewhat like Jesus Christ. So we pray your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and turn to page 336. 336. Near the cross. Near the cross. 336. As we sing. You have a need, 
Maybe it's just God teach me to be quiet and controlled Christian. Jesus, here we go. Jesus.